Hello and welcome to Lorbeck Luxury Cars. I'm Harry and on this edition of the Friday Drive again, we're doing something a little bit different. We're actually going to road test, well, I don't know, let's see how many cars we can squeeze in. But because of everything that's going on, we're doing it a little bit differently and we're going to find out if we can actually road test one of these cars inside the building. Now that may sound a bit stupid, but let me explain to you because it's actually not as silly as it sounds. So you dotted all around the building are certain obstacles which test, I guess, certain aspects of the car, like this ramp here, which gives us a good insight into the ground clearance that you get in a lot of these sort of really sort of sporty cars. So I guess what I'm saying is sort of where, you know, how much room you've got under here, see if it scrapes a nose. But there's more. As we walk along through here, you'll notice that we've got a variety of different road surfaces, like this one, which is very grippy which is quite a departure having come from what is a fairly slippery surface back there. Another good test. Then as we drive through the detail bay, we've got different levels which sort of go in a few different directions. Now even at low speeds, this will determine whether a car gets easily upset by various changes in the road. And then of course we get to what can only be described as a very pedestrian sort of test. A turning circle test. So we'll come along, go around this pole and see if we can do it in one go. You'd be surprised how many cars can't actually do it and which cars actually can do it. So let's pick a few cars and put them to the world's shortest road test. So where do we start? Well, what better place to start than with this uh, MY 2017 Porsche Panamera 4S update. So underneath is a new twin turbo engine, and then inside you've got every conceivable luxury you could think of. Multi-adjustable front and rear seats, four zone climate control, rear blinds pack, heated and cooled front and rear seats, LED headlights, the upgrade alloys. This car has got the works. So let's see how it goes on our very short road test. Okay, car number one in my 2017 Porsche Panamera S. First things first, let's select our driving dynamic. Now I think of course, because it's only a very short drive and we're not gonna go fast, we have to, of course, have it in Sport Plus. Lovely, press the map. How good is this screen? It is just the best. Anyway, let's proceed. There's so much kit in this car. I mean, it's a bit overwhelming when you first get into all these buttons, which are all touched. They're not actual buttons. They're just sort of surfacey things. It's quite a nice sensation being able to come in, everything just sort of lights up. Anywho, and of course going down this, no problem there at all, and feeling a little bit warm, so I might put on my ventilated seat. And for my imaginary passengers a bit cold, I'll put on the heated seat. And of course, even in Sport Plus mode, it really is taking all these bumps and undulations with great aplomb. It's no problem for this car at all. And even though the V8's gone in this car, it still has a really pleasant engine note. And being a modern car and a Porsche, of course, when it comes to doing a U-turn like this, it does it all in just one go. Super, super easy. Especially impressive in a car that's actually an all-wheel drive. And that's a bit of a problem because it means that I can't actually show, well, I mean, it actually did show, but the problem was that it didn't actually get me a chance to show you properly the full-on reverse camera system we've got here. Look at that, look at the detail. I mean, you can even see tiny specks of dust on the ground. It is just incredible. But anyway, enough about that. Let's continue on and see if we can't find out a little bit more about the Porsche Panamera 4S. It's tempting to give it a bit of welly, but unfortunately we've got only a limited amount of space to do it. So, obviously not wise, but... That exhaust note, even though it's a six cylinder, is very tempting. So, I think we've got a fairly good idea that this is actually a pretty good car. So, it would be interesting to get it out on the open road and see what it's really like. But anyway, that's for another time. So, let's sum this up and then move on to something a little bit different. So, I think we can say the Porsche Panamera 4 SMY 2017, a bit of a tick. So where do we go from there? Well, I think it's pretty simple. Let's do something completely different. Like this, our 1994 Ferrari 512 TR. Now this is no ordinary 512 TR. I mean, yes, it's in Rosso Corsa, and yes, it's got the Ferrari beige interior, but there's something particularly special about this one. And that thing is that this car has only done just a shade over a thousand kilometers from you. It is still a new car. So inside, you've still got the protective original plastic film covering the carpets and the sills. And 
it is like a new car in there. It is an absolute time warp. So it's actually quite good that we're not going on a full blown test drive in this because the last thing we want to do is put the Ks on it. So instead, let's just put a few meters on it and see what's what with the 512 TR. Okay, 512 TR, let's wind her up. Yes, there's nothing more satisfying than the sound of a V12 Ferrari engine being started. Now you will, of course, for the more expert in all these Ferraris, know that this is in fact the successor to the Testarossa, hence TR. And of course that means it was designed by Pininfarina, who I think did a very, very good job in designing this car. I think it's one of the best looking Ferraris ever. Now I've actually driven a Testarossa from Sydney to Noosa, of all places. And what I can say is that even on rough roads like this, it's still a surprisingly compliant car. And it's got so much to keep you entertained as you go along. Of course, you've got pop-up headlights. I mean, who couldn't love that? So now let's see if we can get this around in one go. Ooh, it's a bit tight, but, ooh, have I got it? No, no. It's a problem with old supercars, they just don't have the world's best turning circle. But it's okay, because the visibility isn't too bad out of one of these. It looks like the kind of car that would have very poor visibility, but in fact it doesn't. Now we go along, let's scare him with a bit of lights and horn. Yes, how good is that horn? There's nothing better than an old air horn. As we come along, we continue on. We come to the big question, can it make it up the ramp without scraping its nose? Well, let's find out. And uh, da, 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 da. I think it did it. That's not bad. So do we have time for one more car? Hmm. Ah, stuff it, I think we do. So I guess for the 512 TR, it's another tick or two thumbs up, I guess. So last but most certainly not least is this our MY 2017 McLaren 675LT. Now I've been unequivocal in saying that this is my favourite McLaren, well modern McLaren ever built. It just has a rawness to it which you don't really get from the other McLaren and I think it just looks the business. If you're going to get a hypercar or something very close to a hypercar, this is not only the one to go for but also incredible value considering what else is on the market. But anyway, enough about that. Coming back to this car. Now what you will notice is that it's finished in what has got to be, I reckon, one of the best colour combinations. Simple, but very, very effective. Really shows off the lines in this car. And it's got all the MSO carbon fibre inside and out. You'll also notice inside that it's got the orange stitching in the full Alcantara interior. And with just a shade over 1,600 kilometres from you, this, like the 512 TR that we were driving just before, is still pretty much a brand new car with a massive saving off the new car cost price. Now we know what a 675 LT is like on the road because we've done a Friday driving one before. So let's see what it's like on our little test course. This could be either really boring or quite interesting. Let's hope for the latter. Okay. Oh. Strap ourselves in. Well, not quite sure why we're doing that, but anyway, it's just better to be safe than sorry. And off we go. So of course you don't want to put your foot down when you're up here because it's very little grip. So we'll scrape along, well, skid along. And because we've got a bit of an angle, I'm going to take this part, I'm just going to tack it, rather than trying to go head on, we'll tackle the head on on the way back. And now we mix it up with the road surfaces. And the thing that's always amazing about these McLarens is how well they cope might put the window up here, is how well they cope with varying road surfaces, particularly road surfaces that are in pretty poor condition. They really do handle it in a way that you wouldn't expect from a supercar. Now, the big challenge, and to be honest, this is a bit of a foregone conclusion for me because I've already driven one of these many times, is the turning circle. Can we get around in one go? Oh, it's a bit squeezy, and I think, well, to be honest, I'm not surprised. I knew it wasn't going to get around, but it doesn't matter because we've got parking sensors, front and rear, and if you'll notice just in the corner of the camera, I have got a reverse camera. So even though the visibility for a supercar is pretty good, you don't really need to rely on it because you can rely on all the other technology to get you through to the other side, which is exactly what we're doing now. Now, of course, with these ground clearances, a bit of an issue. So you have to take these undulations and 
slightly ordinary road conditions fairly carefully and you spend a lot of time tacking to make sure you don't go every five minutes. Now of course the temptation is to see how fast the car will go in here. So you don't seriously think I was going to do that do you? The biggest test of them all, getting up the Lorbeck ramp. Now this is a perilous job and oh, I don't think it's really going to be able to do it head on. So you've got two options. We go back and we tack, or I go through the menu here and I select lift kit. And I select it up and the whole car raises up, which means I can then proceed on like so without a care in the world. And then once I get over, I just hold it down and the whole car drops back to normal ride height. How good is that? So that's the 675 LT. Now, even though it didn't really quite overcome all the obstacles that we had challenged it with, it's fair to say that the optional extras on this car certainly made those issues no problem at all. So what can we conclude from our little experiment? Well, you don't actually have to drive a car a whole long way to realize whether it's either a good car or not such a good car. A car's personality shines through even when it's just sitting there, even at idle. So you can really get a feel for a car even though you can't really take it out and enjoy it. And that's part of the joy of collecting cars, I guess, the fact that you can derive enjoyment just by looking at them or even just listening to them occasionally. You don't have to drive a car to the absolute limit to know how to enjoy it and to really appreciate the technology and performance that is contained within each of these cars. So I guess in conclusion, even though now is not really the best time to be able to enjoy a car in the sense of taking it out on the open road and going for a Sunday drive, you can still enjoy these classic cars and now with the market where it is, it is the best time to invest in either an increasingly valuable collectible car, super collectible, modern supercar, and a high performance everyday car with all the latest tech. So come down to Lorbeck Luxury Cars and buy any of these cars or any of the cars of course we've got in stock and we'll see you next week.